Kathy, and it's a pleasure to be with you. So South Africa, like the rest of the world, is facing COVID-19. We are into the unknown. Decisions are being made on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, COVID-19 has affected every single aspect of our lives. So we are about to enter month three of our lockdown. There's been much debate about the lockdown itself in South Africa. Did it achieve what it was aimed at achieving? Flattening the curve. And that means slowing the rate of infection, of transmission, and of course, uh, the number of infections. And another important aspect of the lockdown was to prepare our healthcare system to respond to the demands of COVID-19. What do the numbers tell us? We know that 1,210 people have died and over 75% of, uh, of those are in the Western Cape. What sort of planning is happening in that particular uh, province? And what are you as a South African citizen most concerned about? There's a lot of anxiety, but people have very constructive feedback for the government. They've got constructive questions and also unanswered questions that are very pivotal to their lives. So we'll try and address some of those this afternoon. Later on, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Anben Pillay. He is the DDG in the National Department of Health, but you'll also remember that he was the acting DG for most of the COVID period, as it were. I will be speaking to epidemiologist and uh, specialist with Discovery Health. We also have uh, doctors from the Western Cape who are on the ground working with patients, seeing patients. And of course, later, Mia Malan, who is the editor-in-chief of Beggy Sisa Health, they are the go-to platform if you want the very latest uh, trends, debates, policy, analysis, and just uh, basic discussions. And most importantly for me, it is the voices of the people, the voices of people who are on the ground, the workers who have to navigate unsafe public transport systems, the workers who are affected by COVID, communities who are concerned about access to health, access to food, all those anxieties that many poor people in South Africa have. We'll try and address as much of that as possible. Let's go now to Cape Town. I'm joined by Dr. Khadija Hyatt, who is a GP working in Bela on the Cape Flats. Welcome to you, Khadija. It's a pleasure to have you on Rise Above. Thank you, Reddy. Thank you. We also um, have Dr. Yanki Talyard, who is an infectious disease specialist working at Tigerberg Hospital. Let's start with you, Khadija. You know, the GP is that first go-to person when we are not feeling healthy. What are you seeing on the streets? What are your patients saying about this particular time? Yeah, so Reddy, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's it's been a very challenging time for gps particularly because we are at the forefront and we have to treat every patient with a very high index of suspicion um, the difficulty is that you know this virus is so confusing and it's it's so new um, and the clinical presentation of patients just is so diverse you can have a patient who comes in with the typical flu symptoms and then you have someone who's coming in with something as simple as dizziness and uh, who after a few consultations lands up being having coronavirus so yes it is it is a very challenging diagnosis to make um particularly for the primary health care um but there's also quite a lot of fear there's a lot of stigma there's a lot of um lack of understanding in the community on, on the transmission of this disease how severe it is and who actually is at risk of this disease. Mm. And uh, Dr. Yankee, let's bring you in here. I mean, there are a lot of politics in the Western Cape in particular, but we try not to get bogged down with that. This is about lives. This is about improving people's lives. We know that the conditions in informal settlements, not just in Cape Town, uh, but in different parts of South Africa, are a huge concern, the densely populated areas and so on. Are we targeting, are we approaching this COVID-19 in a way that responds to our unique circumstances? What can you tell us about Cape Town? Yeah, really, that's a difficult question for me as a clinician in, in the hospital to, to, to accurately answer. But my, my opinion, uh, working in groups, uh, planning, is that there is an attempt. There's a real honest attempt to, 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 to be aware of the, the circumstances. Um, our, our government officials, uh, Department of Health, are very well aware 
of these conditions and are trying to address those. But as you, as you, as you know, those are extremely difficult um, situations, especially the informal settlements. You can't expect somebody to isolate in a small little um, one-room shack um, with, with 10 people in it. So there are definitely um, 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 areas designated to take people to if they can't isolate. But uh, and again, very difficult to identify each and every person with infection that may transmit to his or her family and then take them to a, a specific facility. So you are definitely going to miss some people. And now with the big outbreak in the Western Cape, those numbers have overwhelmed us completely. And proper contact tracing, proper identification of risk, um, uh, people at risk uh, has become almost impossible, which is not uh, a South African problem. That is across the world, you get to a point, um, almost a tipping point where you just realize now we need to shift to mitigating the damage rather than to, 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 to still try to flatten the curve. Um, luckily, I'm a clinician. I can work with the sick people. Uh, that I know well, and I'm not too much involved in the modeling of how the epidemic evolves and when to uh, uh, implement specific measures um, at specific times, although I have some input from the clinical point of view there. Okay, we'll get to that in just a moment. I just want to read uh, some tweets. We asked the audience to continue talking to us, sending us their questions. Let me just read this tweet. It says, if I contract the virus and survive, will I develop antibodies and become stronger against reinfection? Well, you both doctors, who wants to tackle that one? Khadija, I'll go to you. <laughs> I'll actually give that to Dr. Talia. It's a bit of a complicated um, uh, concept at the moment. I think there isn't a straightforward answer with regards to reinfection, but I don't know if Dr. Talia has anything to add to that. Khadija, I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree with Khadija. It is a complicated um, 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 area, uh, and it's complicated because we don't have all of the information at the moment. What we do know is that people who, who get symptomatic disease, uh, which we estimate is probably about 70%, uh, um, and there's many different percentages for that, but people who get symptomatic disease, uh, a majority of them do develop antibodies uh, by day 10 to 14 after symptoms have started. That said, we don't know whether those antibodies actually protect you against reinfection. The presumption is that they do, uh, but there's no direct evidence from science at the moment that they, that they actually do that. However, if you look at places like China and even some of the European countries that have now almost over the peak of the epidemic, there's not a large scale um, um, reporting of, of reinfections happening. So the, I think the assumption that if you do develop antibodies, uh, that it is protective, at least for some time, uh, is, a, is, a, is a safe assumption. Mm -hmm. You said earlier, Dr. Teller, that you're completely overwhelmed. And I, I, well, not just the Western Cape, but South Africans want to know, you know, the lockdown had specific aims. One of them was to prepare our health system to respond to COVID-19. What is your sense? Did we achieve that? Yes, absolutely. I think it was a, it was well timed. It was well implemented at the right time. Um, obviously, one cannot control for all the little things that happens in between. That needs to be um, and delegated to different departments, and the departments may not speaking to each other. But those are peripheral issues. The the main aim of the lockdown was to 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 um, implement social distancing, um, prevent people from from getting into contact with each other, and that was extremely effective. And even now. We have a, a massive outbreak in the Western Cape, but the rest of the country is currently very kind of spared from, from this massive outbreak. And the, 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 the curve has been flattened in the rest of the country. And I think people don't remember that. They, they, they just see the big outbreak in the Western Cape and then they look at the total number of cases, which are more than 50% in the Western Cape, and then say, well, you know, it's not working. It has yeah, had a really good effect, but you need to balance that with the, with the social, and the economic effects of a, of a, of a, of a um, shutdown. And I think uh, the government is doing quite a well job in, in, in trying to balance that. Okay, we'll talk about the socio-economic conditions um, and I'll ask you that question, Khadija, since you're a GP working on the Cape Flats and you know, asking what else we can do uh, to better prepare ourselves and to better respond. Let me just read this tweet quickly. It says, uh, does the country have enough ICU beds to handle COVID-19 patients? Khadija, what are you hearing? I know you don't represent the department, but as a, as a doctor speaking to your colleagues, um, do you have a sense of this? 
Um, so I can tell you that at the moment I feel and I hear that there are enough CU beds um, at, with the situation at the moment, but I don't know if that's going to be the situation for very long. Um, I think that mm -hmm. at the moment I feel like the, the healthcare system isn't completely overwhelmed, but if the surge continues for much longer, I, I do think that ICU beds, both in private and in our public sector. Mm. You know, Dr. Tayad, we are a country that's facing other pandemics. Uh, they may be under control, we may be doing well and be used as a model in the rest of the world, but we know that we have a high burden of TB cases, HIV uh, cases. I've heard some activists raise some concern that as we single-mindedly focus on COVID-19 and get our health systems ready, other aspects of our public health system have suffered. There are patients who complain that they're not accessing their TB medications as fast as they normally uh, 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 can, that uh, policy and just uh, vigor in, in um, uh, handling all the other pandemics has diminished as a result of COVID-19. Uh, what are the risks there? Is that a true reflection to start with? Yes, I think it is. And it's, it's again, it's not special to us. This is what happens in a pandemic when, when, when everything is, is, is focused on overwhelming numbers of patients becoming infected in a very short period of time. And unfortunately, you need to be ready for that. And, and to do that, you need to downscale some of your other activities. And uh, remember, we don't only have the, the, the HIV and TB, we also have the diabetes, cancer, the major if, um, issues in, in, in South Africa and in the African setting. And there's already reports coming from the UK where they have now documented the, this, um, the, the, this, this problem, uh, where they see now that the epidemic is, is coming down, that is more and more advanced cancer patients presenting to, uh, to the healthcare facilities. And uh, we've also already seen diagnoses of TB and HIV um, um, not being made at the same rate as we used to do it before the COVID outbreaks. So yes, it's happening and I think it's expected to happen. How we are going to mitigate those 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 negative effects is actually the, the more important answer, rather than that we should have avoided it from happening because it's almost impossible to avoid this happening. Mm. And Khadija, just going back to that aspect of the socio-economic conditions under which many people live in South Africa, you know, when I reflect on COVID and what it has cost, even people who are wealthy, people who are socially mobile, who had jobs, education, they're very anxious about their future, their income. So how much more somebody who is poor, living in an informal settlement, somebody who's hustling on the street, and as we tell them to stay home, number one, which home? But if I stay home, what will I eat? So COVID-19 really an intersectionality of all our societal um, our societal uh, uh, problems how serious is, is is fear of hunger uh, amongst your patients and obviously that impacts uh, health outcomes as well absolutely um i agree with you fully and i think that said very well um so yes so a lot of patients are coming to me and saying that they are high risk but they don't want to stop working because if they stop working, they, they won't have an income. And they look at me and they say, doctor, please can you write a letter to say that I can still work because I can't, I can't afford to not have bread on my table. And it's, it's such a difficult thing to, to tell a patient, you know, so a lot of the companies are sending them, sending patients to us for um, medical assessments. Um, where we can assess them as being high risk or low risk. And it, with an, when a high risk patient comes to you and, and pleads with you to not say that they're high risk because it might impact on their, their daily bread, it becomes quite a difficult situation. Mm. Let's bring in Mia Malan at this moment. She is the editor-in-chief of uh, Begisisa Health. I certainly rely on Begisisa for my daily uh, understanding, interaction with what's happening around me. And she's got a fabulous team of journalists who are on the ground analyzing uh, the data, speaking to the decision makers, and actually calming some of the hysteria that you often find as a result of misinformation. Mia, can you hear us? Welcome to you. Mia, Malan, are you with thank us? You. Can thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes, I'm with you and thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so very much. Let's deal with um, COVID-19 and information. How 
open has the government been? How quick have they been with their information? And can we rely on it? What's your sense? So, you know, I think at the beginning of the epidemic, we were all very excited because the approach of the government was so much different from our previous epidemic, or that is still an epidemic, HIV, that information really was much more accessible, you know, and we can also, we can trust the national, um, the NICD. We can really rely on the information. It's not like in many other countries where you have to distrust that information, that it's not accurate and that they didn't record the cases. But I think as we have moved on with, it, with, with COVID, of it. Um, some cracks have started to show. One of it is, and you know, epidemics are very much just like a mirror of society. Even if we prepare during lockdown, it will still show that the, the cracks that are that have always been there, it will, it will still reflect those cracks. Now, one of the things that have always been hard for our health system is to collect district information and to do it accurately. So one of those things that are hard to access at the moment is district health information. So to give you an example, we have in collaboration with another media organization, Media Hack, we have a dashboard that is widely used that we take the daily statistics and we put it and we visualize it so that it's meaningful to people. And one of the things we try to do is to map hotspots. So on a district level, we want to be able to show people where are there more infections than in other places. So for us to do this accurately, we need to be able to update this map regularly because you know, the information will change as the, the epidemic progresses. And one week we can find it from the health department, the next week we can't. They would say, no, the information is inaccurate, they can't give it to us. Now, that has always been quite a difficult thing in our health system. It, it doesn't matter what you ask for on a district level, it's hard to access that. Now, why do you need it? Mm -hmm. Because if we have that information widely available, we are better able to hold the government accountable. But it's not just about the media, then people who want to help organizations and specialists will also be better equipped to help because they will know where to help. So it's okay. something that we really need to look at in COVID to make that information more readily accessible. Oh, I think, I th I think if we if for nice, instance, yes. look at a country and like like Kerala, a state in India, the there is a there is a dashboard on you know that really has live information as to how many hospital beds yeah. are available how many tests have we done today and i think that would be very helpful in south africa indeed in fact i've seen so many people posting on social media where are the hot spots and uh, it's almost as if sometimes the questions become a political uh, a political game amongst political parties even uh, requests for a racial breakdown of the cases which is important we'll talk about it uh, later all of that using it to play the little political games meanwhile it should be about health and it should be about planning and it should be about uh, saving people's lives let's just uh, get this information or this input uh, from um, a citizen of South Africa who sent us this uh, video. I'm Maria, I'm a nurse, I'm doing door-to-door -door testing and screening of Corona. When you go to the public, people will be, will be complaining that they don't have food. And then people, they don't even want to be screened. They don't believe that Corona is real, it's alive. My name is Iris Nswai. I'm staying in Kanana Kokoleto. How to keep the distance? We're using one toilet, one tap. So we are really not safe on this COVID-19 because how many hands are touching on that tap? Hmm. And uh, in case you didn't hear the audio properly in the second clip, I mean, that's the reality. And Khadija, that's the last word uh, from you before I let you go. I mean, she's saying that how do I socially distance when we are sharing a tap, so many hands on that tap, there are few toilets for members of the community. It's almost impossible uh, to socially distance. But the nurse who spoke uh, earlier talking about the, the, the mistrust um, that in some sectors, as they go door to door trying to screen people, there are some sectors of our society that don't take COVID-19 uh, seriously. Do you have thoughts on how we can educate our citizens better, Khadija, as you sign off? Yeah, so I think there, there are two things here. One is I think education is important and I think that, you know, um, TV shows, radio, we need to get the message out through avenues. Um, 
But I also think that it's important for us to look at an approach that's different to the rest. Like you said, our situation is very different. We can't look at a hospice-centric approach to dealing with COVID-19. We need to look at our communities, and that's where our strength lies. Because of our history in South Africa, we've got very strong community structures. And I think it would be really detrimental to us if we don't make use of those existing community structures to safely isolate patients who are in the situation um, that your guest uh, alluded to. And one of the things that you know I've been thinking about with a group of people is to start community health uh, care centers where these community care centers which allow people who are in overcrowded homes to safely isolate where they wouldn't be putting a risk to those around them and their community where they'd be able to be close to their families um, and yet safe um, so so that mm -hmm. is something that we need to think about we, we're just struggling with funding at the moment but we're working on it all right. Khadija, thank you so very much for sharing your insights. Uh, we wish you well as you continue to be on the front lines. You guys are the most important people to us and to our communities at this uh, moment. So thank you so very much for chatting to us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we'll continue that theme. Uh, we have another doctor joining us, Dr. Leanne Brady. Now, she is a public sector doctor, but she's also an activist who spends time on the grounds, in the townships, in the Western Cape, and has a lot uh, to share about what's going on there. Thank you so much for joining us, Leanne. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, Lee. Thanks so much. Hi, can okay, you hear me? I'm to hear Dr. Leanne Brady. We're going to try once again. Can you hear me, Dr. Leanne? Welcome. I can hear you, yes. Okay. While we uh, sort that out, let me continue the conversation. Remember, we've got Mia Maland, who's the editor-in-chief of Begisisa Health. We also still have infectious disease uh, specialist from uh, uh, Tigerberg Hospital, Dr. Yankee Talyard. Uh, Dr. Talyard, I just want to go to the community screening aspect. There's a lot of... Um, well, it's not controversy. You know, we're making decisions on a day to day. The decision doesn't, the, the situation doesn't stay the same on a day to day basis. When we first started on this journey of preparing South Africa's response on COVID 19, there was a lot of talk about contact tracing and community screening door to door, as we saw with that nurse. But I read an interesting article that also quotes some of the government uh, advisors, some of the scientists that are advising government. And they're saying, forget about that. Because of the backlog in cases and uh, th th that we have, a whole lot of those results are now, you know, a whole lot of those tests are now useless because so much time has passed. So leave that alone, rather go into the hospital, test the healthcare workers, focus on them, focus on the people who come to the hospitals and are sick, get their results as quickly as possible so that they can get treatment. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you've summarized it extremely well, really. Uh, that's exactly the problem. The laboratory capacity um, uh, is limited, not necessarily only because of the, the laboratory itself, but also because of the reagents, et cetera, that needs to be imported sometimes and, and, and where there's a shortage. So uh, that has limited our ability to turn patients around in the hospital. In other words, people are admitted to the hospital and uh, uh, you need to test them before you know what the diagnosis is because you need to isolate them. So there's a limited number of isolation beds available. And if you, if you can't get a result back quickly within one day or so, then that patient needs to be remaining in that, that isolation room until you have the results. So the longer people are waiting in the isolation rooms, so you get a bottleneck and you can't admit more patients. So a quick turnaround time for your results is very important. And so those are priority patients for your healthcare facility to manage these cases. Secondly, uh, then uh, the second problem is that uh, with healthcare workers, you also need a quick turnaround time on your testing because these people need to come back to work uh, to, 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 to be able to, to sustain the service that we do um, um, give people. So um, <laughs> with the backlog, it, um, sometimes people would wait for a week or longer for the results, which obviously is unacceptable. Also, after a week or two, the result becomes um, obsolete because you can already, if you had infection, you can already de-isolate. 
So really you want to turn around time on your, on your results very quickly. So your summary of what you've read is absolutely correct. And that is why you have to prioritize your testing. And this has happened all over the world. That at some point, again, there's a tipping point where you prioritize and your community testing goes down on your priority, priority list. It doesn't disappear and you can still do community testing, especially in specific hotspots or where there's outbreaks. You can right. still continue doing that. Um, but uh, in terms of preserving your, 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 your healthcare facility's ability to manage sick patients and save, save lives, I think it's very important that you, you, you take the lab capacity into consideration. Mm. And Mia, just very quickly, perhaps we can finish that, that point that we had started on about uh, the racial breakdown of, of the patients. I mean, w why is that important? Let's just forget the political parties that have raised it, what their intentions or aims uh, uh, were. But why is it important that we have that understanding? I think if we have, you know, if you break down the demographics of where a virus spreads more than in other places, you are better equipped to know where to intervene more than in other places. But I think another aspect that we can maybe look at um, when it comes to COVID is the human and emotional aspect. You know, I had an interview with um, someone who has two um, family members in an ICU unit in a very well known Cape Town hospital. And it's really, really traumatic in the sense that you're not allowed to go and visit the patient um, and if a doctor then doesn't give you feedback and in her case she didn't get feedback the doctor did not let her know what's happening to her sister and her, her, her brother-in-law it becomes very very emotional and hard to handle and it's also very hard in a socio-economical level where for instance in this patient's case where the mother and father was in hospital and there was a two-year-old child that had to be taken care of it was very hard for the family to intervene because they didn't know would this child for instance infect the family where there's people of comorbidities but when it comes to testing the western cape does really to okay testing. hi um I'm here. can you hear me Right. The Western Thank Cape you. has what Dr. Yankees has said now, now adjusted a, a testing policy to, to only test testing certain more vulnerable populations in order to save tests. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lien, I hope that uh, you can hear us now and uh, welcome to the conversation. And uh, what we were talking about as I was welcoming you was the conditions on the Cape Flats and South African townships uh, where people are anxious, they don't have food, they can't socially, uh, socially distance, and whether or not this lockdown demonstrates not just from a policy point of view but from an empathy point of view whether it it you know it it, de it demonstrates the the required amount of empathy that takes into account those unique circumstances you are a public sector doctor and you are also an activist on the ground what are you seeing are you feeling hopeful about the direction we're taking as a country hi hi ready and yeah thanks so much for for inviting me on on this afternoon okay, so i mean i, I guess Dr. Lien, unfortunately uh, i don't know we can hear her Okay, it looks like everybody else now can't hear Dr. Lian. Just bear with us. This is the age of technology. We're trying to get an eclectic mix of voices. Sometimes the connections work and sometimes uh, they do not. But I still have Mia Malan, who is the editor-in-chief of Begi Sisa. And we also have Dr. Yanki Telyad, who is an infectious disease specialist at, uh, at, at, at Tigerberg. So, Doc, I'm coming back to you. Um, with the lockdown the easing of the lockdown moving from one level to the next i'm thinking about new zealand who waited until they had not reported any positive cases of COVID for three weeks before they went to lockdown level one and also the world health organization itself has 
its guidelines about when countries should ease lockdown. It looks as if South Africa is going against that particular, uh, 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 those particular recommendations because our rate of infection, our cases are increasing. Was this the time to ease the lockdown from a health point of view? From a health point of view, no. Uh, but it's not only the health point of view that one needs to have a look at, and, and, and luckily I'm not one of the, of, the, of the policy makers to make those decisions. But from a health point of view, if we could, still, if we could all just stay in our houses for, for another six months and not go out and still be able to live in that way, then obviously that would be the best, because then nobody would infect each other and there would be no new infections. It's not practical. Our economy will not last. So there are difficult decisions that have to be made. And I think there would always be um, uh, criticism, um, whichever kind of decision one do take. Uh, but uh, as I said, luckily, I don't have to do that. Um, the, the medical point of view, well, the you know, obviously. Yes. Okay, Sorry. complete your thoughts, doctor. No, no, from complete a medical point of view. Sorry, um, um, yeah, no, from a medical point of view, you know, the WHO recommendation is clear. Uh, but it, 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 it's just from the medical point of view and life doesn't work like that. Indeed. Well, let me thank you for sharing your time with us, for sharing your expertise. I say this to you as well, uh, Doctor, please stay safe, stay well, because we need you guys there and we appreciate every day that you spend in those hospitals saving lives. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. And Mia Malan, Editor-in-Chief of Peggy Sisa, always a pleasure chatting to you. And thank you so much for the kind of journalism that you are doing. Uh, I think it is helpful, it is educational, and it has opened certainly my eyes uh, in interesting ways. Thank you so very much, Mia. Thank you, Reddy. All right, so thanks. We continue our conversation, and this time around, I welcome the Deputy DG in the Department of Health, Dr. Anban Pillay. But I must also mention that for much of the COVID period, he was the acting DG in the department. And so many of you have sent us questions, you've sent us videos, and we're going to play them and get him to respond uh, to some of those. Dr. Pillay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us on Rise Above. Uh, good afternoon, Reedy, and good afternoon to your viewers. Uh, hope you're well. Thank you. I'm going to start on that particular point, uh, you know, where I left off with Dr. Telyard about the lockdown. I know that there were a lot of South Africans who were starting to agitate, saying that uh, it is draconian, we need to move on, it has achieved its, 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 its role, our economy is on its knees, just get on with it. And there are still some who believe that the president responded to that particular pressure. Let's park that for just a second. Looking at New Zealand, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, I used the World Health Organization's own standards about when to ease the lockdown. Was this the time to ease the lockdown as our numbers are going up? How do you explain that? I think we, we, we have eased the lockdown from the context of a what I would call a level five lockdown. And when we introduced the lockdown, we had no idea what the spread of the infection is across the country. And over the period of the lockdown, we had a very clear sense that there are uh, clusters or pockets of infection across the country, uh, concentrated in, in, in about four or five provinces. And so the question was, do you need to have the same level of lockdown across the entire country? Or is it more appropriate to have specific levels of intervention at those levels of, of, of infection in the country? So where there are high concentrations of infection, let us have a more stringent, high level uh, intervention at, at places where they've never had an infection or they've had an infection one, once in uh, uh, two or three weeks, they don't need to have the same levels of, of, of restriction. So having what we call a risk adjusted strategy, which is a differential approach based on the level of infection in an area. So we moved away from the lockdown because it's a blunt instrument. It just basically locks everybody up irrespective of whether there's infection in their area or not. And I think this, this approach is more surgical in its approach in that it identifies the areas and tries to prevent people in those areas from spreading the infection on. There was a concern that was raised that there isn't enough information about where the hot spots are. Of course, we know uh, that the Western Cape has uh, the highest number of cases. Uh, we know that they've got 900 and, uh, 927 deaths as the country in total has 1,210 deaths. And 
Dr. Pila, you know, just transcending this one-upmanship that we sometimes see between politicians and provinces and so on, looking at the, 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 the numbers in the Western Cape, but also remembering that early on in the pandemic, I remember the Minister of Defence, uh, Ms. Nusivu Mapisa Makula, saying that Santon and Bedford View were hot spots. And that also created that kind of class argument that the white people in the suburbs, the rich people are infecting the poor people. Be that as it may, is it not important for us to have specific details about where the hot spots are? The sense is that that information is not readily available and not consistently available. What do you say? Yes, I, I think that uh, we can certainly provide more granular detail around that. The one challenge that we have in doing that is that the uh, laboratories that do the testing, both public and private, do not capture the information about where a person lives at the point at which they actually uh, report the data. So in other words, we have somebody that's positive that lives in Johannesburg, but we don't have the street address, so we're not able to map that. So we're busy trying to amend some of that work so that we can provide more granular data. But at this stage, certain provinces like the Western Cape has been able to, to provide some detail around where the, the high concentrations are. For example, we know Tigerberg is one such area and there are several others like that. So I think some provinces are able to do that. The city of Jobel's provided uh, information at a district and a sub-district level. But I think with time, we're going to be ha uh, we're going to have to provide more detail around that. And I agree, currently, the, the information is not granular enough. That's largely because we don't have that level of granularity, because information coming to us is fairly limited from that context. All right. Um, I think as, you know, there's benefit to being frank, identifying the problem, calling it what it is. Uh, all countries have been faced with this newness. And as we plan and prepare and respond as a country, it's good to have uh, the information and also acknowledge areas where we're not able to uh, uh, to excel, as it were. Let me welcome at this point uh, Dr. Nolutando Namatsoreni, who is uh, an epidemiologist and is the head of clinical excellence for Discovery Health. And uh, it's, it's lovely to have a conversation between the private and the public sector because we are in this together, are we not? Dr. Nolitando, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It is not a public versus private, it is a national problem. Mm -hmm. And th there's been that commentary that, you know, the private sector in South Africa would be better able to respond and there were concerns that the public sector wouldn't be. And I don't, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but when I look at this COVID-19, it no longer matters because we interact with each other at our places of work. We interact with each other in, 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 in public spaces, in grocery stores and, and so on. So hopefully we come out of this with an understanding of the universality of the experience and the importance mm. of empowering mm. all sectors of our society. What are your thoughts on that? I agree with you fully, uh, Ridi, and I think, I mean, we do understand the current um, healthcare system in South Africa, but I think this pandemic is calling for both the public sector and the private sector to work very well together to make sure that whatever solutions we come up with, you know, are for the benefit of the country and not for a a particular sector and I think so far we have seen really both sectors mobilizing you know and looking at the you know various resources that are on both sides and making sure that it is for the benefit of the South African population mm -hmm. and for this town hall meeting you know we invited South Africans to just send us their thoughts their experiences and their videos let's take a look at this before you respond I am Sadar Abu Baker a general practitioner my practice is situated in the central business district of Laudium. Due to the rising number of COVID-19 cases in my area, I am very concerned that not enough tests are being done. The results are not coming in early enough. I would love to see a situation where we can actually get patients' results quite fast and so we can pick up patients without symptoms but with COVID-19. So we could ask them to isolate themselves and that way prevent the spread of the virus. So my name is Kiwakile. I'm working in one of the health facilities in Gauti province. Me and my colleagues, we tested for coronavirus on the 18th of May 2020. 
Yet so far, we have not received our results back. Rebecca Solani, I'm staying in Kanana Squatter Camp. We need help in our shacks because our shacks are close to each other. We don't have that social distance. We don't have enough toilets. We don't have enough water. Please help us. I tested today because I'm sick. I'm in an isolation for 14 days. I'm waiting for my results. Help us, please. I am Sadat Abu Baker, a general. <sighs> Dr. Pile, I'll go to you for this one. Perhaps let's deal with the patients, the healthcare workers who are still waiting for their results. There were some contradictions uh, between health officials around the extent of the test back backlogs. So many questions around that. Can you address them, please? Yes, <clears throat> I think the, the, uh, the greatest problem that we have is that the demand that we have for tests uh, do not align with the capacity that the public and private health system have jointly to be able to deliver these tests. Uh, simply because the uh, lab kits that are used to actually perform the tests are in limited supply globally. Every country, as you know, is uh, uh, testing and testing as many people as they can. Uh, and unfortunately, the suppliers of these kits are fairly limited globally. And so we've been trying to get as many kits as we can to perform the tests. And so both, both our public and private labs have uh, had a very limited ability to test all the people that want to be tested. The consequence of which is there's a backlog of tests that need to be done. So there's more people that have been sampled and the samples are now awaiting testing, but the machines are available to do it, but the reagents that are required, which is these kits, are in short supply. And so as these reagents become more available and hopefully the global north uh, um, uh, uh, epidemic is slowing down, we, they may release some of the test kits that they've been consuming to us so that we can do this. So that's the big challenge globally uh, for us to access these kits. And Nolutando, just a comment on that, you know, the question, are we testing enough? Uh, but also adding from an innova innovation uh, point of view, are we having the right conversation, the private sector in particular, because of the funds and the resources that, are, that often reside there? Are we, are we loud enough and working hard enough uh, to innovate, as it were? So I think really in the, in the testing space, uh, I mean, um, I, there isn't much uh, innovation at, at present because we are relying on the same uh, test kits. Um, and I mean, there's a process in terms of validating test kits that need to be used, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector. So reliance on test kits is really for both public and private sectors. I think from our side, it's really how we facilitate testing and appropriate testing, specifically in the private sector, because we need to be cognizant that there is no room for you know, inappropriate testing in the private sector because whatever shortages that are, exist impact the whole uh, country. So I think that's that's maybe the message that I'd like to you know to to get across around the fact that even if you are a private patient, there are guidelines that are, are out there that the Department of Health and the National Institute for Communicable Diseases have published around who is eligible for testing, so that we do not waste tests. We need to be very prudent in how we use them so that the right patient gets, you know, tested. Mm. And, and, and just on that, uh, uh, Dr. Pillar, not everybody who tests positive um, needs hospitalization, right? But I can imagine if I test positive, I wouldn't know what to do because this, this is new and we're scared, we're reading too much, we're exposing ourselves uh, to COVID-19 information. It's good, but when it's overdone, it creates this hysteria and, 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 and lack of control and panic and so on. So if someone is watching us now, they've tested positive or they suspect they have uh, COVID-19, what, what can they do so that in taking care of their health, they also don't create an unnecessary burden on the system? Uh, you know, that's a very important question and a good question. I think it's important to highlight that many people may be COVID positive. Some are symptomatic and some are completely asymptomatic walking around and having actually no idea that they've actually been infected. And so I think when you, when you do test positive, it's important that you isolate yourself, which means that you're not in contact with other members of your family 
visitors or anybody else, and you remain within that area within your home, and you, all of your utensils, your your, your clothing, etc., is separated from the rest of the family, as well as your your, your use of the toilet and bathroom, etc. Uh, needs the, the the details of which are on our website. I think that's critical. Not everybody obviously needs to come into hospital and a doctor would make that decision as to whether you need to be hospitalized. 80 to 90% of people actually will not need any hospitalization. The uh, COVID infection will be like going through the common flu and they will just go through it, have a few minor symptoms, sometimes nothing, and they will get over it and they'll be back to normal. It's a small proportion, 20% that, uh, that may possibly have some symptoms and some may need to be hospitalized. And a very small proportion of that actually will then go into ICU and require ventilation, et cetera. The problem is that of the entire population, if you had 5% of people that are requiring ICU care, that's 5% of 60 million people as an example. And if all of them wanted to access the ICU at the same time, that's where the problem is. And that's why we talk about flattening the curve is because we're trying to time these events such that we have the resources available at every at every point in time. So it doesn't mean that you're infected, that is the word actually, for the majority of people that is not the case. Okay, let's see some more uh, input from our audience. Here's this video. My name is Spiel. I work at the hospital pump. And right now we don't have sanitizers, we don't have disinfectants, we don't have cows. And we are working here without all those support that we need to, to counter this COVID. Again, I think that can be directed at the Department of Health. Um, I'm just thinking about how other countries managed to flatten the curve. Was, was, was it Japan that gave every every citizen um, two masks and sanitizers were readily available. Why can't we do that, Dr. Pile? Give everybody in South Africa masks and sanitizers. Is that possible? <clears throat> I, I, I think certainly we, we need to make every effort to get every citizen to have a mask and a sanitizer. Walking around, uh, uh, I get a sense that most people do have masks. I think the issue about sanitizers is a supply chain problem. Very often the people responsible for making sanitizers available in a particular environment don't monitor the basic thing of checking, well, how much of stock is available and ordering in time to make sure there's a continuous supply. So it's more a supply chain problem than an availability problem. On the issue of masks, I think that there's sufficient masks going around and most people should have a mask. If I get the details of the gentleman in the video, I'd be very happy to make sure that they, they get access to this. But I, th I think this, this problem is predominantly a supply chain problem. Just like in the schools, uh, they, they were, there were stock of masks and sanitizers purchased, but they were not at the schools at the point when they needed them, simply because somebody in, in the supply chain dropped the ball in terms of that. Yeah. Yeah, and Noltano, just on that, I mean, our standards have to be so absolutely high. There's absolutely no reason why a hospital cleaner, a hospital uh, a worker, a porter should not have a mask. The, the one thing that would really, really break my heart is if we prioritize certain lives over others. I mean, I go to a shopping mall down the road from my house. Mm -hmm. There are sanitizers in the parking lot, in the lift, everywhere. I want to see that for that man who's also cleaning, mm -hmm. who's cleaning toilets in, uh, in the public sector. We've got to change our culture, don't we? No, we definitely have to change our culture. I wanted to almost emphasize something else already, because like um, Dr. Pile was uh, emphasizing around, you know, access to some of these items, you know, supply chain issues and stuff. We also need to emphasize the importance of hand washing using water and soap, because that has been found to be very effective. Because if we limit ourselves uh, to sanitizers, when we may be having access to you know, just uh, ordinary soap and running water. You know, we need to just educate people about the basics of hand hygiene. And in instances where there is no availability of running water and soap, then that's where we talk about hand sanitizers. But I do agree that those, uh, you know, um, hygiene issues need to be addressed and people need to be educated and access need to be made, um, you know, available for, for them to, uh, yeah, 
for them to access those. Let me just read this tweet. Oh, it's just disappeared from my screen. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but South Africans have been tweeting. They have been asking questions. I remember one tweet that we read earlier. I don't have it now, but it spoke, uh, Dr. Pile, about uh, people with comorbidities comorbid like uh, uh, TB, HIV, cancer, all of those. And they wanted to know specifically what percentage of people who are losing their lives now have comorbidities. And I think that's important, Dr. Pillay, because early on, there was a sort of, even overseas, young people were being told, don't think that because you're young, you are almost guaranteed to just survive uh, uh, COVID-19. Yes, your being young is a factor, but you may infect other people too. And I saw a report on an international broadcasting platform also saying that uh, the low death rate, as it were, in Africa may be because of our youthful population. You don't want to share that information so that you create some complacency. Uh, but, but, but what are the facts? We need to know that. Uh, so we, we've been collecting the data around the morbidity and mortality linked to the comorbidities. So people who have COVID as well as other diseases and which, which other conditions seem to predispose you to a greater negative outcome. Uh, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases has been publishing this information on their website. But from the data that I've seen thus far, it would appear that diabetes and hypertension are up there as probably the most uh, uh, predominant uh, um, comorbidities that when, when people have this together with COVID, they have a negative outcome. Uh, the other conditions are obviously cardiovascular disease, um, uh, respiratory diseases such as emphysema and COPD. Um, in terms of uh, TB and HIV, the uh, correlation is not as strong as diabetes and hypertension, but certainly there are patients that have had a negative outcome that are both uh, um, HIV positive or have had uh, TB. But the information is uh, published on the NICD's website on a on a fairly regular basis. Uh, it's obviously a function of those patients that are admitted and those that have a, a negative outcome as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a, a tweet. Ask them for the proof that the virus and smoking are connected and what country came up with that evidence? Hey, this one is a hot potato. I'm not saying anything. Let's talk about it. I know the matter was in court just uh, um, uh, yesterday yes. and uh, what, what do you say, Dr. Pillay? Is government smoking I think it's socks? Important. Uh, the, the reality is the Department of Health has always had a policy of no smoking, and we have implemented a number of uh, pieces of legislation that discourage people from smoking. I think, let me start there. On the issue relating to COVID and uh, smoking, while there are no scientific studies that have proven the relationship between smoking and COVID, it would be reasonable to, to extrapolate from the uh, scientific data that we have that smokers who are exposed to a viral infection have historically had a negative outcome compared to the normal population. And that's that's been there for, for a long time in the, in the uh, uh, scientific literature. So COVID is a, is a virus, just like other viruses. So we don't anticipate that there should be any difference in terms of the outcome if you're a smoker and you are contract COVID. Now, can you, you, you change that? Certainly by stopping smoking, you could certainly change your outcome in the short term. And we would encourage people to do that. The World Health Organization also on its website discourages people from smoking and draws a link between COVID and uh, uh, smoking. But makes the point as I'm making that we don't have any studies, but the absence of studies then requires us to just look at the primary evidence. Okay, so let's see how this one plays out. Let's just get some more input from our audience. I'm Renee Nelson. I know there's no vaccine for coronavirus, but we'd like to know what the people can use if they feel if they get a, a fever or the pains or whatever. Can they recommend the people something to use, please? My name is Dizu Plakis. Yeah. My question is, how long is this going to last? Do we have any vaccine that is coming in South Africa or any of the scientists that are making a vaccine? Or we have to wait to the Americans, to the Italians or to the British? That's my question. 
is there any recorded time frame or estimated time frame of recovery uh, in relation to COVID-19 patients? Okay, Dr. Noltando, I'm just going to start with you. I know you're not seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, but you are an epidemiologist. Yes. I thought that first question was yes. valid because, you know, there's no treatment for COVID-19. So if I have symptoms, I'm feeling ill, I don't want to burden the health system, what can I take? So that was a very good question because a lot of people don't know what to do uh, once they are infected. So we understand that, uh, you know, some patients may actually present with no symptoms and some will have mild symptoms. So right now what we're recommending is that treatment is really supportive. You know, it's symptomatic. If you've got fever, you use paracetamol, um, you know, whatever, uh, you know, it's marketed as whether it's Panado or any other paracetamol containing, um, you know, a tablet. Um, for sore throat, you can use still uh, the same uh, pain medication. But otherwise, there is no real um, approved treatment that is specific for COVID. So everything that we recommend is, um, you know, supportive care and bed rest, lots of fluids and, you know, isolation at home to make sure that you don't spread the, the, the disease. Uh, if you've got headaches, you still use the pain medication. So there isn't really uh, any medication that is directly uh, related to COVID and approved specifically for the management of COVID. Most of what we are recommending is supportive care. Yeah. And Dr. Pile, I thought that question around the vaccine was very important. We know that there is no vaccine. Uh, people just want to know the time frame uh, for the development of a vaccine. But there was another layer to that question that I found interesting. I mean, the gentleman, I know the audio wasn't great, but mentioned, uh, uh, you know, first world countries, European countries, uh, the United States as well, uh, saying, you know what, we know that scientists are hard at work, but where are these scientists from? And should there be a vaccine, at least that's what I heard, is it people from those nations that will access that vaccine and the rest of us in the global south, in the developing world, may very well be ne neglected? Who is leading the search for the vaccine and how democratic is that process? That's a very good question. So there are over 150 odd studies going on to try and find a vaccine. Um, I know some, some have announced that they believe a vaccine may be ready, be ready by September, October. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, these vaccines obviously have to be evaluated before we can make the call and say we now have a vaccine. Uh, in terms of the access to a treatment when it does become available, there's, there was a, a, a discussion at the World Health Organization and a number of global leaders, including our president, was part of that discussion, emphasized the point that when a treatment becomes available, it needs to be available globally at a price that is affordable to all countries to be able to access. The worst thing we can do is develop a treatment and reserve it only for the wealthy of the world and basically then uh, uh, ask the global south to pay that price and we know they won't be able to afford it and the consequence of which is going to be high mortality in those countries and so i think there is global agreement about that uh, it'll be the first time globally that we've actually implemented a policy approach uh, like that and i'm hoping that this may uh, well be a test case for for, for further products that have a, a global uh, response and uh, companies need to respond in that way so that everybody can have access Mm -hmm. And Dr. Nulitand, I mean, discovery generally, what are you doing to make sure that your services are available to, uh, uh, to all and they're democratic in the, in the way that I asked about uh, the vaccine? So I think from our side, um, from a medical scheme side, COVID-19 is a prescribed minimum benefit. And that means that if you have COVID, you will be covered uh, in full for your treatment, um, you know, whether it's hospitalization and out of hospital. And I think it, in that, in those regulations, uh, vaccination in terms of prevention of COVID-19 has also been incorporated. There is already provision within regulations for us to fund for, for, for the vaccine once it becomes available. And I mean, we know that a vaccine development takes time. Yeah. Uh, so we are really hoping that for this particular infection to be fast-tracked 
And I think um, we are hoping that by next year we will have a commercially available product that could be available for, for all members who actually qualify to have it. And I know that you are helping your members uh, see their doctors virtually. Uh, a lot of yes. us uh, can't yes. access our doctors yes. physically. We're trying to minimize yes. the, tra the traffic and so on. Uh, but the whole population, are you helping them see doctors? Yes, so it is not only restricted to Discovery uh, Health, uh, in fact, Discovery Health administered schemes. It is really open to the broader South African public. This was in partnership with That's Vodacom. Great where we are making these online consultations uh, available to minimize exposure for, for our doctors and also even for our patients, because when you are in the waiting room, uh, the exposure to, to COVID infection is real. And also our doctors, I mean, we want them to be available um, and not uh, be exposed to sick patients in a manner that would expose them such that they are also infected. So that was that really the reason why. Sure. I just want to tell uh, people who are watching that I'm, you know, I, I'm always so anxious when it comes to technology. And the idea of having a virtual consultation was just so odd. I did it about six, seven weeks ago, and it was great. Uh, not only did I save time and resources, but I managed to get the conversation that I wanted with my doctor. Uh, there were no interruptions whatsoever. My script was emailed. It was just so smooth. And I wonder, even without COVID, if I'll go back to the old way of seeing my doctor. I just see that I could continue. Uh, online just doing it. Let's just watch this video. Hi, I'm Colin Seister. My question is with regards to Western Cape, um, our, our numbers are significantly higher than the other provinces and also our fatality rate. Uh, initially they said it was due to our testing um, capacity, but uh, we, how do we explain the number, the, the, um, the higher number of deaths and also have they done the social demographics and to, to see uh, what uh, what races uh, groups are more uh, negatively affected by the by the virus what will happen to the country if the number escalates since the schools are open because we having number increasing in the eastern cape so if the country wide the number increase what will happen Mm, I think those are very important questions. Let's deal with the Western Cape one. We did touch on some of those themes earlier, Dr. Pillay, before you joined us, but it would be great to hear from uh, the National Department of Health about the Western Cape, yeah? So uh, I think initially the Western Cape was doing a lot of tests, but I think it's important to highlight that we do more tests in areas where there are higher levels of what we call positivity rates. So when we do 100 tests, and if we find that there are more people that are positive in that batch of 100, that suggests to us that in that community, there are higher levels of community transmission. So we need to go deeper. So we go and do more tests there. So it's true that there are more tests that are done in the Western Cape. But the reason we're doing that is because there are higher levels of community transmission because of higher levels of positivity. But what's happening in the Western Cape is going to happen in the Eastern Cape, is going to happen in KwaZulu-Natal and in Gauteng. It's, it's, it's the natural course of what generally will happen. So I think it's not, not a case that the Western Cape has done something wrong as such, but it's just the natural course that started in the Western Cape. Now, we, we've had a chance to observe the way the epidemic has played itself out in the Western Cape, and we're hoping that the uh, provinces of the Eastern Cape, KZN and Gauteng, will take lessons from that and how we can adjust our strategy to make sure we don't uh, make the same mistakes that we may have made in the Western Cape when we an encountered the outbreak there. On the, on the racial distribution, I know in South Africa we like asking about race, it's, a, it's, 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 it's an important thing, but in this case, from the data that we have, uh, there is no statistically significant difference in terms of mortality between people that of any race that have been in, uh, hospitalized or have had a negative outcome in terms of death uh, based on COVID. Uh, uh, probably the more relevant question is those that have a so lower socioeconomic status, what has been their probability of being hospitalized relative to those that have a higher socioeconomic system, because I think those are more relevant questions to ask. But I know in South Africa, it's usually presented in this way. We had a lot of debates about this question. 
Mm. And I just want to read this tweet. I'll go back to the question that was asked by the second gentleman, what is going to happen in the country? The schools are, are, are opening. If the rate of transmission increases, if infections increase, what are we going to do? Are we going to lock down again? I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But here's the tweet. It says, who is being held accountable for the mess of the Eastern Cape hospitals and clinics? When is something in capital letters going to be done about this? Quick to declare Nelson Mandela Bay a hotspot, but who is in the hot seats controlling this? Dr. Pillay? The, the Provincial Department of Health in the Western and the Eastern Cape, sorry, together with the uh, Provincial Department there, is responsible for the COVID response. We in the National Department uh, attempt to assist them in, in, in the best ways that we can, so we can mobilize resources in, the, in, in terms of tests, in terms of equipment and human resources, and, and the like, but it, the, the management in the Eastern Cape Department of Health are effectively responsible for the delivery of the service that we're in contact with them on a almost a daily basis, trying to support them to deliver a response, bearing in mind that the Eastern Cape Department of Health has not been as well resourced as many other departments, for example, the Western Cape. Department of Health. And so they, they, their response is obviously linked to the resources that they have. So we're trying to mobilize additional resources that will assist them in responding to this more effectively than uh, the way they have been to date. Why are they not better resourced? I mean, is that a nice way of talking about uh, corruption? I know you're not a politician, but hey, let's talk about this. Is that uh, referring to wastage over the years, uh, not investing in infrastructure, money that's disappearing? I mean, the, some provinces are notorious for those kind of problems and they're coming back to bite, isn't it? Well, I mean, I, I can't comment too much on the on the corruption part of it, but what I can say is there there is a formula by which each province receives an allocation in terms of financing, what's referred to as the provincial equitable share. And if you look at the health portion uh, that the Eastern Cape Department of Health has received over the years, and this is going back over 10 years now, has been far lower than what we had recommended they should receive. And that's largely a decision of the provincial treasury in that province as to what needs to be uh, the financing of health care of a particular department. And so consequently, when you have underfunding, you have lower staffing levels, equipment levels are lower, etc. And then when you have COVID on top of that, which basically stretches the resources, even in a well-resourced environment, then all of these problems will then manifest themselves in the way that Hmm. Very disturbing indeed. Okay, I, I do want, uh, before we wrap up, to answer the gentleman uh, who asked what happens next. We are on lockdown three, lockdown level three. People are expecting us to go to two, to go to one. But there are predictions about when we're going to peak. It's broken down province by province. End of July for Gauteng, between end of July and September. And I don't know, you know, I... <laughs> When I read some of the articles, there's almost like a fatalism, a fatalistic type of approach that, well, there's nothing we can do. So many people are going to die by this. It just is what it is. There's nothing we can do. Are we walking confidently into uh, the, the shadow of death, as it were? So, Dr. Pillay, what happens if the infection rate overwhelms us even more? Is there room to go back to lockdown level five? So when we introduced this differential model and moved away from the from the uh, the, the full blown lockdown like we had it initially, we had said that we have five le five alert levels, and we would move between them as the 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 environment dictates. So as the infection rates increase in an area, and the uh, health system is unable to cope, we will certainly be ratcheting up the alert levels. Similarly, if the uh, infection rates go down, we would be reducing the alert levels in those areas. So the, the intention is that the alert levels move in both directions. So we could reduce to go to two or to one, or we could even increase to go to four to five, depending on the area and what's happening in that particular area. I think this fatalistic approach is, is problematic. Remember, the, the, the modeling that's been put out assumes a particular level of behavior, but we don't necessarily need to conform to that behavior level. We can prove all of that wrong 
by simply complying with all of the measures that were recommended, basically social distancing, sanitization, uh, 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 remaining at home as much as possible, etc. When we don't do that, then we follow the model, but we can change all of this, all, all in our hands, actually. It's not, it's not something that somebody else has determined. It's very much in everyone's hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, just uh, uh, before we wrap up, uh, Nolitan. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Um, th th there's so much of COVID-19 that does depend on us, that is in our hands. And mm -hmm. I, I would like to, to be in that environment where we are taking so much ownership of our behavior, of the way we socialize, the way we educate children, the way we work. I mean, that's one area where the government really doesn't have a say. You know, I'm not, I'm not in any way <laughs> diminishing the role of the government, but I'm simply saying that we are in this environment where a top down is no longer relevant. How we respond to this and how we model our lives to adapt to the times will determine whether we succeed or not. You are so right, Ridi. Really. You know, it's quite interesting if you read around what happened in Japan. So we look at it as a, you know, a success story, but most of it was not really driven by government. You know, government yeah. actually did not even impose the, 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 the strictest lockdown like we have, but it was really society enforcing some of those uh, behaviors. So, and I think it's very important to realize that we are responsible for, for what happens uh, eventually in terms of adhering to social distancing practices, hand hygiene. And I mean, I do know that there are limitations for other people, for example, to quarantine, to isolate because of social circumstances. But I do believe that there is a lot that we can still do. We do see instances where uh, people are in crowded environments. People are still not uh, appreciating the importance of wearing a mask to protect others. Because remember, wearing a mask is really about, about protecting somebody else from potential infection that may be, uh, that they may be exposed to if you are coughing or sneezing or talking and spreading the droplets. So it's about really adhering to those and calling people out. I mean, I've seen people who are wearing masks and their whole nose is out. And, and mm. I mean, that's a proper way Some of wearing a mask. I might add. And you, you observe that, I mean, uh, even at shopping centers and you are thinking, do I say something? And I think if we start saying something, then it becomes something that is not okay uh, for people to walk around wearing a mask half-half. Uh, you know, uh, when we see people crowded in, in, in environments, we must be saying this, this is not right. And I think, I mean, other countries have got that in their culture. And I think it's something that we need to almost develop as South Africans if we are to beat uh, COVID-19. Indeed. Well, I must thank you both for chatting to us, for being so generous with your time. And we continue these conversations to just educate ourselves, uh, to calm the hysteria. There's a lot to be anxious and concerned about, but I think it doesn't help us when we don't base our reaction on uh, reality and on facts. So I thank you for helping us do just that. Dr. Nolitando and Dr. Pile, thank you so much. Thank you, Ridi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for watching.